I, I do have a, a, a sort of a, a pressing question. So I work with um, English language learners, but not necessarily with in, in, in uh, developmental uh, courses. So a lot of students that I work with um, see AI as a way of bridging the gap and erasing those notorious deficiencies that they perceive and others have made them perceive throughout their academic lives. Um, yet, using AI, they may not get the capacity to, um, to bridge those gaps themselves. So I just wanted to know if you guys have experienced the same thing. I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to think about what students are doing and trying to do and what capacities they have and will have. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, that's a lot. <laughs> Oh, it's great. Thank you. Anyone else want to want to respond or? Well, I'm teaching my students how to query it. I mean, to you know, that's uh, one of the principal things is. Uh, you know, we I started with them with very just kind of general queries and results of it. And I did something similar to Frank um, there. I had we actually were writing a personal essay early on in the semester and I pulled student models from previous semester. But then I also slipped in a chat GTP uh, model of it. And interestingly enough, they um, recognized that it was different in uh, voice and tone from the other ones, uh, the other pieces. Uh, and then that's when I explained to them, um, you know, what the, the issue with it was. But then we've spent a lot of time since then learning different ways to query it and um, to use it really in writing support and instead of content creation for the most part. And, um, you know, the more detailed, I mean, it's pretty obvious, the more detailed the prompts are, uh, the the more you dig, you can I show them lots of different ways that they can query it, turn it into games. Um, we play games. Uh, we've had it create games for us where we could learn how to identify comma splices, uh, for example. Not that we spend a lot of time talking about that, but, you know, um, but it was a uh, so that's kind of been the way that I have been addressing it is to teach them to query it in ways that will produce more productive um, writing and um, so you know that's kind of what's uh, and I started like when I first started this uh, playing around with it about a year ago like most people a little a little bit past that I had a several high school people that I support come and talk to me about students were using AI in their dual enrollment classes and so I started researching it and um I put together what, what I, a presentation kind of like Frank did and with, I had about 30 slides, I think the first time that I did it. Now I'm up to 105 mm. um, slides with it, right? Because it's changing so quickly and it's moving. And um, I wrote a, um, a faculty guide for dual enrollment uh, students or for dual enrollment um, instructors in, in, I guess, February of last year. And um, from that, and then since then, I've been using it a lot with my students, though we talked for a long time about the ethical issues around it and the dangers of putting the information um, in there. And, um, you know, we, we talked quite a bit about uh, the ethical issues around the AI checkers um, as well, um, because, of course, there's a lot of uh, discourse coming out about that now and how, um, you know, the the companies like Turnitin are using the their AI checker, of course, to build a better one. And it's like a, what is it, a $17 billion company or something like that. So we've, we're talking a lot around the ethical issues around it too. But that's kind of some of my experiences so far. Right now I have an honors um, class that is building an AI guide for students on campus. And they've completely, they've researched all of the, of the different issues and they've come up came up with nine different parts uh to it so it's written in student voices and student concerns and one of the sections they insisted on it was um what to do when you're in sh when your professor accuses you of using ai because of course error uh the, those are they're so bad they error so badly um even the best ones are you know it's kind of like a like a lot of companies uh, overpromise what they can actually do in terms of AI detection. And 
Um, the first thing that I put into, I, I had a stack of eight different AI detectors, including um, ChatGTP Zero, and I put our academic uh, integrity policy in it. And seven of the eight of them uh, identified it as written by AI though I was in the room when we wrote it in 2007. So um, it wasn't, and I put some Frederick Jameson in there for you uh, uh, literary scholars out there. And it, uh, it, it identified Frederick Jameson as, a, uh, as AI written, right? Cause it's so heavy, the discourse is so uh, formulaic kind of, and um, it's, it, it sounds like something Jameson writes, like something like AI does if you uh, query it to ask to um, respond uh, at a graduate level. So it's, I've been playing around with a lot. It's been a lot of fun for the students uh, too, even though about half of them, um, when we first start talking about it, have not done anything with it. I was surprised last summer. By the way, June, I'm so glad you're here. And I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself in a minute. I was surprised with a summer class that I taught of incoming freshmen that every single one of them had put their hands on it in some way already. Uh, I was not expecting that. I was expecting the opposite, you know, so, and that alerted me to the reality of, which I already sensed, I've got to be talking about this and be upfront with them and, and convince them that I know a lot about this so that they won't be think twice about messing with it. You know, like that's yeah. kind of part of my approach right now. Um, I did have that experience that you mentioned, Jim. I had a student that I called after I found that one student, you know, I found another student that had paragraphs and I called him out on it and he defended himself and said that he did not use AI in any way and went on to, to explain to me that he used the information from the chapters that I had assigned in the textbook that we were using. And I said, maybe you did not cite if you took information from the textbook. He said, oh, we're supposed to cite the, the classroom text. I said, and I said, yeah, so we had a learning moment and it was all good, but it also said to me, well, you know what? We don't know where AI is getting information. It's stealing it from wherever it can find it. Maybe it even came full circle and took it from our book. Who knows? But it begged that question that if if he took information from a published work and AI is taking information from a published work, then that checker is going to say he used AI. Um, so I've been very, very cautious with using any checkers at this point uh, because of that experience. I think one of the biggest things that I've tried to explain to them and my colleagues, I think a lot of them have had the same issue is understanding how it works differently from Google, right? Like, because they're so accustomed to students going out there and cutting and pasting something, right? And putting it in a paper and, you know, traditional uh, plagiarism, though a lot of times, you know, the it'll be just patch writing or something like that. But the... Um, you know, that's just not how AI works. I mean, it it recreates, right? So it pulls stuff from a bunch of different things, recreates it every time. And so um, every creation of it is in essence original, right? And um, so it's very, it's a very different animal uh, dealing with it in terms of plagiarism and having conversations about students. And that's why we spent a lot of time talking about the ethics of it, talking about how to cite it, um, but also a lot of times showing um, the problematic nature of it and particularly the hallucinations, because um, that's what's so dangerous for the students. Um, and it's kind of like the early days of Wikipedia, you know, I mean, you every, uh, I mean, you can have fact, fact, hallucination, fact, hallucination, right, in one paragraph. And so it's a uh, it's it's um, it, trying to explain that to them and to the colleagues because colleagues think, well, oh, it just went out and grabbed this, you know, from the internet, and that's not quite what it did. It did, but then it recombined it, you know, in a prediction of what, um, you know, a human would sound like um, if they're writing. So it's it's very yeah. very different. Suleiman actually uses the word prediction when he talks about uh, the etymology of the word read when he explains um, large language models and how um, breed actually means, if you go back to the etymology of Old English, to predict, to guess. Um, and he says that it's the way we read is we learn patterns. And by learning patterns, we predict the word sometimes before we read it. Um, and, that, and that's how reading works. And they've managed to be able to program these machines to do that. And that's, that's what we're seeing now. Um, and then, yeah, they're not always gonna be accurate. Um, also, this presenter that I heard today said 
they're like a good puppy. You ask them a question, they're going to be obedient and give you an answer. It may not be right at all, but that's not the concern. The concern is to give you an answer. So, but you ask the question again a week later, you're going to get a totally different answer because they learn from what they don't know as well. Um, so it's it's just like like you said when you introduce yourself, it's a fast moving target. Um, Jude, can you uh, say hi and tell us? I want to ask you a question after you introduce yourself. Can you talk to us about how you're using it with reading levels? Because I was going to mention that tonight. Sure. Hi, I'm Jude Maynard. I am a teacher at Narragansett High School, and I also have been an adjunct in the writing department for a couple of years now. And at the high school in particular, we were using the AI program to relevel a challenging text. And we were realizing that we needed to have some support in order to make that happen without taking out the concept academic vocabulary. So we were able to filter in the words that we needed to maintain. And then we copied and pasted the text at its original lexile level. And it rescored because we were able to input which lexile points we needed. So we were able to re-level it for several different students, everyone getting the same experience with the text, but at the level they needed it to be met for them. And that was really exciting work. And that was probably one of the first times that I had seen AI not be condemned as a cheating tool which was really exciting for me to be able to celebrate that. But it's interesting when we're talking about that learning machine, because that's exactly what was happening. Every time that we put that text in, it was teaching itself how to reframe, restructure, reproduce the text. That was fascinating to me when I read what you wrote to me. I have been using that, by the way. I, I used it yesterday in three presentations. Um, I thought that was one of the most positive and and in, ingenious and effect and and just pro student ways that it could possibly be used from anything I've heard so far. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Frank. I actually have to give a shout out. My husband is an educator as well, and he was the one who had first originally thought he needed to relevel a text, and he was pro provided something by the publishing company that he was using for his particular text but all of that academic vocabulary came out of it. So as he and I were having this side conversation, he said, well, let's give this a try. So I can't take credit. I'm just absolutely benefiting from it. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm very, very um, new to using AI um for anything or with students so for me it's been like working with students one-on-one -on -one. i was telling frank um earlier that i got to the child in american history but my background is american lit so some things i know but not in as much detail so i rely on like google ai search um to give me the details that he needs because it's not that he doesn't have the content for him he just needs to talk through it and so for me to talk through it with him i need those extra details and then another student I was working with on his writing, we didn't use the AI to generate anything. We used the AI to sort of help him evaluate his paragraphs. So we would enter it in like one paragraph at a time and he would read what he wrote and read what the AI wrote. And if it was like a four paragraph essay, um, two of his paragraphs were better and he kept them. And then two of the um, AI paragraphs were um a little bit clearer and more concise, but I think it was great because it was based on his writing and things that he had already researched as opposed to him just creating the content. Erin, mm -hmm. can I ask a follow-up for that, please? Yes. I, I love that idea regarding his support that he needed to improve his writing. What mm -hmm. do we do with those two paragraphs that AI generated that ended up being better than his version does anybody have an idea on how we reconcile that? Because I love the idea of it, mm -hmm. but how do we move forward without compromising the integrity of the person who's producing? So um, we didn't address it. We were just writing a sample paper. He wasn't turning it in anywhere. Um, and all the resources, like everything was in there. It was cited. 
it were things it was just like the wording was really cleaned up a little um but I think if I were to do that again because it was like a one-time thing if I do that again with another student or with a group of students um I like to write in a, a table like in in word but like a table with each section like this is the introduction and so what I would probably do is um left column is well first column is what we wrote second column is what the AI said and then the students would have to do some type of evaluation of what's the difference between this these two why is one better than the other um and then we would then have to work on how do we cite um you know what we used so I think moving forward if I were to do that again I would um and I also just did this thing where I um you know, I teach um, elementary reading methods courses. So I was just like, well, let me see if I can get it to generate um, in a reading intervention plan for a second grader um, whose fluency skills um, are not on target for the beginning of the year. And it gave me the whole thing. Um, and it like, based on what I teach about, these are the strategies we use for students who need help with fluency. You know, everything was there. I haven't like fully evaluated it, but I mean, it would be a really good place to start um, as opposed to starting from scratch. Um, one of the things that's been on my mind too is um, this is a media literacy issue, but, um, and we talked about this today too, like people were talking about using it to, um, to like, look at statistics and, and data about students and student success and and um, you know using it as a, as a means of evaluating tests and measurements. And my concern became because I saw I saw the documentary in 2011 Google in the World Brain when one of the co-founders of Google started first started talking about this publicly, they were creating Google Books and he said yeah we're, we're creating AI. that's what we're doing. He was very upfront about it. And they want our data. Um, and we have laws about <laughs> sharing data. And we also have students who really aren't prepared to be aware that everything they're putting in AI is being used by the creator of AI, including if there are names on a paper, if they're, you know, and we have to address that. We have to address their safety. These bots are now on their social media, um, catfishing them, like they're real people, trying to create relationships with them. There's AI now on on um, Snapchat that they can use, and you know that that creates a safety issue. More important than plagiarism is <laughs> is their safety, and in this in this new online, you know, environment. So that's been on my mind a lot too. And then the whole inequity issue of, um, you know, once something gets good enough, like ChatGPT, they charge you for it. And the people that can afford it win. And now we're right back there again. You know, so those are some concerns that go beyond the writing part. I never even thought about the safety piece, Frank. That had not even occurred to me. You know, Jude, I do that presentation with the students and I, I show them the, um, we have the conversation about the Kevin Roos article, which Scott, I don't know if you were there at, at C's last year when I went to that presentation, one of the speakers talked about the Kevin Roos article where where the chat GPT started hallucinating and telling him that he, it was in love with him and it wanted him to leave his wife and, and you know, it started talking about its dark side and revenge and just crazy stuff. And I said, this is on this is that was in February. It's only going to get better. And these kids are going to get duped by this, thinking that they're talking to, to a new friend. Um, and not just kids, I mean, any of us, you know. Anyone else like to share a way in that they're using it that's different than what we've heard?
I'm I'm uh, trying to use um, AI tools in a way that I think kind of supports students' writing processes, and um, you know, not positioning it as you know a tool for cheating, um, but as almost kind of like a writing assistant. And so what I've done is. Um, I'm teaching online this semester and every week at the beginning of the week, I have very clear sort of um, guidelines about which tasks that week they can use AI on if they want. I don't require any students to use it. And then what I've found has been most helpful is um, I kind of create what I just call sort of starter prompts for them because I realized that if I didn't give them some kind of prompt that they would just go crazy, you know, or be confused or just let AI do everything. So what's been really what, I, you know, it took a lot of playing around on my end, but um, I found that, for instance, their first project was a literacy narrative. And so I gave them a prompt that said, basically, like, act as a college writing tutor, help me brainstorm topic ideas for a literacy narr narrative I'm working on, ask me a question wait for my response, and then ask another question. And so it wasn't really generating material that they could put into their literacy narrative. It wasn't even generating topic ideas. It was asking them for information to help them generate their own ideas. And um, so far that's been, I think, really useful. And then of course, whenever the students use it, they, um, they share their chat conversation with me. They write a whole reflection about how it went and whether they'll use that um, output in their writing and how they might use it in their writing. That's really cool. I love that piece. I had used it for suggestions for brainstorming ideas and whatnot for the narrative writing, but I hadn't thought about doing that before. That's really cool. So another piece that I've been using it for um, two different courses, one, we were doing some summarization and paraphrasing strategies and they were able to use the AI support for that, give them some ideas, and then even to measure, they actually graded their own paraphrasing. So they put in the original and then they put in their paraphrase and they put in score the, the following blah, blah, blah. And then they actually got some feedback, not from me, but from AI. So that was cool. And then finally, the last piece was for the journalism class. We had just done the study of the ethics and they ended up putting in some framework about how to find case studies for ethical evaluations. So we've just been playing a little bit, making it more fun and game-like, but with some kind of constructive focus so that they see that there is a need for putting in something specific in order to get what you really, really need in the outcome. You know, I, one of my students, I've challenged one of my students to, or my one of my classes to try to come up with something creative, um, a way to improve the writing. And so one of them put my prompt um, in it for the essay um, that they were doing. Um, and then um, he put his essay in it and asked it to evaluate his essay based on the prompt and give him feedback um, on it. And then he compared that to the feedback he got from me the feedback he got from his peers, and then he saw the feedback um, there. And I mean, his conclusion basically was that each, you know, everything, every, each group that he asked, um, he got different information from. And then we played around with it quite a bit um, in class once, you know, he'd gotten feedback and you know, so it would make a suggestion like um, in this paragraph, um, you need a, a better concluding sentence that sums up the idea that you had about X, Y, or Z, right? And it would it frame it there. And then he would ask it a question like, um, so what are ways that I can go deeper um, with it, right? And it would give him three, you know, give him a list of ideas, sometimes five, times, sometimes 10. And then he might take one of those, okay, what are other questions that I could answer based on this? And he just scaffolded it down. And then, um, you know, he, he really was struggling with coming up with what are fruitful ways that he could go deeper um, with it. And this gave him some ideas about doing it. But then we had a conversation too about, you know, like what is original to your experience? Because you're completely depending upon um, this here. Where do you come into this, right? And so then he started inputting information about his own ideas and his own experience 
and asking it to combine the two. And then it really came up with some interesting results from there. So it's just the, you know, scaffolding down like that, it can create some really some interesting stuff. Um, though, you know, most of the time when it just generates something, my students identify that they write better than it does, you know, for the, at, the, at the level that they're writing, because um, it's so formulaic if you just ask it to write general content. I want to share some of the things that I've done with my own writing. I um, I was asked to uh, facilitate a grant writing session with the Department of Transportation. Uh, three weeks, three um, 50, 90 minute sessions online, with 22 um, people from the Department of Transportation. Some had already written grants, some of them really successful and, and a little out of my comfort zone. I do an undergraduate proposal and grant writing class, but this was this was different. These were professionals. This was not a class. There was no test. There was no project. There was no there was no grade. Um, and some of them probably wrote bigger grants than I've ever written, may ever write. And I knew that. So what could I possibly tell them? What did I want to make sure that I told them? So I went to ChatGPT, and I gave all gave it all this information and said, "What do I want to make sure I cover?" And it gave me the list. And from that list, and and if if you go to the slides that I that I shared with you, um, if if you go to that list, I went to that list, and if you go to the link in the slides, you'll see that I created a whole a whole prospectus from that list, developing with my own knowledge, my own ideas, what I wanted to make sure I covered, and most of the things on that list I'd already thought of, but not everything. So it was really helpful that way as a thought partner. Um, so now I'll do things like I'll, I'll put in my syllabus and ask it if there's anything else it would add, or just ask it to create a syllabus for a digital writing and rhetoric class for undergraduates at a 200 level. And it'll create a syllabus and then I'll compare it to my syllabus. And it's been really helping me that way. Um, I've been using Google Bard, which most of us can't get to from through our school accounts. So I've had to go to my other Gmail, but I've been using Google Bard. And, and the reason I like it so much is because it always gives me three responses that I can then compare. And they're, they're always slightly different. So um, that's my new, that's my new writing buddy. Um, and what I, what I'm curious about is like, we talk about voice a lot with our students and how, you know, they have a voice and we want them to, you know, celebrate their own voice and, and certainly they can see the difference. And, but my voice is changing when Grammarly is telling me to be more succinct. I'm becoming a more succinct writer. So now my voice, my own writing voice is changing um, because I'm, I'm becoming more concise and succinct in my, in my message writing. So I'm not sure I'm not sure yet about all of that, you know, but I'll tell you one thing I can't do again, Jude, I have to tell you and your students that I was very surprised to look on my desk one day while I was working and find a card from you all. Thank you so much after your class visit. And I said, chat GBT, you can't do this. So, and, and that will always be true. Uh, Rebecca. You need I think Deborah was before me. Oh, I'm sorry, Deb. Oh, I just I put a question in the chat. Um, since since we're a DE group, are there special um, things that we need to be aware of or concerned about when it comes to DE students in particular and AI? I'm just curious if anybody has thoughts on that. I will tell you, I'm meeting with uh, one of the concurrent enrollment teachers in, in our cohort. Another one, um, like the two that are here tonight, who both teach on campus and teach the class in the high school. And her concern, and she said, I want to talk to you in person about this when I put out the all call. She said, you know, we work with young adults on campus. We work with children in the high schools. And I really want to talk to you about that. And I could I could hear the concern in the way she she worded her question, you know, her statement. So we're meeting tomorrow afternoon and, and I'll be curious to what she has to share about that. We at at my school um, in my department, we have um, sort of a 
a, a very brief AI syllabus statement that's basically just like if you use AI without you know permission from your teacher, that's a violation of our in academic integrity policy. And our our teachers who are credentialed to teach in the high school, so high school teachers who are teaching our classes, are are really um, not they're sort of uneasy with that. Like they want a much more clear policy and procedure for what to do. And so uh, um, on the college side, we're kind of struggling with how best to help them and still, you know, give individual teachers um, some degree of, you, you know, using it like I'm using it, you know, allowing students to use it or not. So, that, so that's a challenge for us. And, and it's hard and because that's not possible right now to give that because this thing is moving like like crazy you know um so that's that's a dilemma but but we can't ignore it either because microsoft word is already using it google docs is already using it so there's no escaping unless we have them go back to using typewriters and pens you know but one of the things that we decided to do at the high school is that any of the more significant writing pieces that we need to absolutely be certain are original, those are on demand. And then the other pieces, our policy now states that AI cannot be a part of your final submission. And so if students need it, it's been written into their 504s or their IEPs. So if they need that extra guidance, like what we were talking about earlier with summarizing or some or, or paraphrasing, they're able to use that as a preliminary step. And Erin, I love your idea of the columns that really, if you don't mind, I'm going to actually adopt that because that is one of the steps. I think we can see the progression. So with every iteration that these students are submitting, we'll be able to see what was their original, what was the little AI support, and then how did you combine the two? which I think is where we need to be headed is there's got to be a synthesis. There's never going to be an absolute. And if we're open to that and maybe being generous with the language that allows for that, I think that we can get to a really, really effective, successful spot. Thank you. Dude, when you said that your students um, have to do the assessment on demand, are they using their computers or are they paper and penning it? We have both um, for the AP because we're going to be doing the exams pen and paper this time. We're doing those on demand with handwriting. And then the others, we actually do have a browser lockdown. So okay. they're in the browser lockdown. They use that one screen. And then I do have one class where several of the students have their own devices. So it's not browser lockdown and they just have to have their backs to me so I can see their screens and they can't toggle between. So it is a combination of both digital and handwriting. It, yeah, um, in my, I'm teaching a Rhode Island college literature class right now. And for the first, test essay, I decided to just, okay, we're all just going to do it paper and pencil because I was worried about students using, you know, the chat to cheat. Um, so we hand wrote them all. And then by the time I was on the third essay, I was like, all right, let's just go back to doing them on the computers. That's how the students prefer to do them. And I actually gave them the choice and all but one wanted to use their computer to generate their essay. And one student completely just a hundred percent of his essay was AI. Um, it was very, very evident. It came back like 99.98%. Um, as soon as I questioned him about it, he had fully admitted it and apologized. Um, but it just, it's just kind of disheartening that you'd have to go back to paper and pencil at this point to assess students. Yeah, I I agree, but I think the the inconvenience of all this is is real. We we have to change the way we teach and the way we assess now, um, to some degree, because of this. I think writing teachers we have it good because we see process. Right, you know, right. So I don't think it's going to be as big of an issue now. in the UR writing one hundred and four class or an issue at all. It's just any of my classes, a lit class. I, I, the way I set up my classes is they use Google Docs and they're required to use it from beginning to end if they want full credit, one document, so that I can always see the revision history and I can always see the comments of the peer reviewers. And once I get them trained to do that, 
um, that makes me aware. And, and, I, and I invite them to use it as part of their process. Just make sure I see that. Uh, that's where I'm at so far. Yeah, this was just oh, a quick uh -huh. test essay, just on demand. It wasn't anything that they did through a process or anything like that. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting for all of us. I think I feel bad. I feel most badly for the other content area professors on, on campus who, who and teachers in in high schools who get that final copy and assess it, um, and now they they don't know if they know, you know, and that's going to be hard. That that's the real that's going to be a real dilemma. So that says, well, how can we look at the way we assess? And like what Jude, what you said is a start. Um, maybe that's the way for today. Maybe tomorrow we'll figure out a better way. I think it's critical to like, I mean, to have them include, you know, if uh, if I'm teaching history, this is what a I did a presentation for our social sciences department, and we talked about different ways to approach it. But because this was the concern, you know, they we threw their prompts in there, and they produced these essays, and they're like, "Oh, this is a B essay, right?" And so, what am I going to do um, with this? And so, you know, we talked about, well, let's let's add um, an article that um, that you have them read in addition um, to it. Let's require them to make two references to something that was said in the lecture. Right. So scaffolding it in um, that way. Right. So that they they're, they're having to draw from sources that chat GTP is not going to be able to just do or any other of these AI that are going to be able to do on their own. But I mean, I feel a real responsibility to, to get on um, teaching students how to use it. Um, my, my wife works at Walmart's corporate office. I'm in Bentonville, um, Arkansas, and, um, you know, they're using AI right now. And uh, they have an AI tool. In fact, they have multiple AI tools that they can use in different situations. I have um, a friend who's an engineer. Um, they're using AI every day, AI tools. I mean, it is, it's not something in the far distant future corporations and you know businesses are immediately adopting these tools and students are going to have to know how to use them um, when they come out asap um it's not going to be you know something in in, in the distance and and you know my wife's using them to work to write emails every single day right um in it because and those are boilerplate i mean it writes boilerplate fantastically Right. And that's the kind of uh, things that people are using it for what I've seen in the corporate world um, a lot so uh, far. So um, I just think it's it is on top of us right now. You know, it's not going to be something that we can um, wait to respond to. And we're going to have to really talk to the, through them about the ethics of using it. Um, much more so than we had to even do, with, you know, the obsession in my field of composition with um with uh, documentation and citation, right? Um, um, it's been uh, uh, something that instructors like to talk about a lot and spend a lot of time teaching uh, students about. But I think just the ethics of when and how to use it is going to be vital. And starting, you know, not when they're college students, but when they are now in elementary school, probably, it needs to be woven into the curriculum because, you know, students, junior high students are using it probably more than high school students are now. Thank you. So it's eight o'clock. Um, oh, sorry. So much, so much to talk about. We could go on for another hour. Um, and maybe we should plan to continue this topic into one of our other sessions this year or plan another session. I want to thank everyone for sharing this conversation. I left you with a, a little meme that I use in my slideshow that uh, reminds me that AI has been with us for a long time, maybe not generative AI. And in my opinion, Clippy was a lot more annoying than what we're dealing with right now. Aaron, do you have anything you want to you want to follow up with? Yeah, I I think it was awesome, like all the different ways that people talked about. And um, for me, like I have very little experience with AI except the things that I described. So I think it's given me um, a way, especially that resource with Chat GPT for teachers, um, a way to kind of make my life easier. Um, you know, in teacher prep, everything has to be aligned to standards for these organizations that evaluate our work. Um, and so when you're trying to generate all of this stuff, you don't really have a place to start. Um, so I think it might be helpful in that respect as well. Thank you.
And I encourage you, again, when you look at the slides, a page of resources that I created. And one of those resources is a list of recorded webinars that Media Education Lab has done. I did one of them. The last one I found very, very interesting and helpful. There were some hard, heavy hitters on that call that uh, said some really important things to me. Um, so if you have the time or just when you're driving or listening and you want to check them out, they're there for you as well. So, um, okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I, I did also want to share um, Sydney Dobrin's book. Um, you can't really see it the way my camera is working tonight, but um, AI and writing, I'm sure it has a lot of the same idea that many of you have talked about already, and you probably read it, but I have been using it with my students and um, just a couple of chapters. And, and it's very, it's really written in very much for students with the discussion questions at the, at the end. So I've found it useful.